Ever catch yourself daydreaming about hitting it big in the markets? Yeah, I think we've all been there. Like who hasn't wondered if it's actually possible to rake in, say, over 40% returns year after year? Oh, for sure. That kind of consistent success, it's practically a legend. Right. Today, we're going deep on this idea, taking a close look at a quantitative trading strategy. This one revolves around machine learning and this concept called mean reversion. Got it. And what's really cool is that the source material we've got actually walks us through how this whole thing evolved. Oh, so it's not just the end product, but the whole process of development. Exactly. Like they start with an idea, test it, find the flaws, and then keep refining it to boost performance. I like that. Transparency and how the sausage is made, so to speak. Totally. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. And that commitment to really getting it right, it reminded me of Walt Disney. Apparently, he was super detail-oriented. Like, there's this story about Disneyland where he noticed the light bulbs on a Main Street marquee were slightly off in color. So instead of just replacing them all, he had one bulb painted half red and half white because the mismatch just bugged him that much. Wow. Attention to detail, huh? Right. And it just struck me that that same mindset that belief that even the smallest things matter is probably crucial when you're building something as complex as a quantitative trading strategy. Oh, absolutely. One tiny error can cascade into a huge problem down the line. For sure. So throughout this deep dive, we're going to break down this specific strategy. We'll look at how it spots potential trades, how important backtesting was in its development, and how the creator found and dealt with both the obvious and the sneaky biases that can sneak into these models. I'm especially curious about those sneaky ones. Me too. And then we'll examine the logic behind its design, the results it achieved, the good and the bad, and the risk management techniques they used. Sounds like a plan. Let's dive in. Okay, so the initial strategy was a long-only approach. It focused on mean reversion within the Russell 3000. So what made it decide to enter a trade? Well, there were two parts to the entry criteria. First, they had this thing called the three-day QPI, it's basically a quantitative measure that looks for short-term oversold conditions. Okay, so like a signal that a stock might be temporarily down. Exactly. It's based on recent price and volume action. It needed to close below 15 the day before. Got it. But that wasn't the only trigger, right? Oh, no. There was a second layer. They also had a machine learning model. Ah, so it wasn't just a mechanical thing. Right. This model had to predict a greater than 60% chance of that stock bouncing back up. So a recovery prediction. Yep, a reversion to the mean, as they say. It's a combo of a technical signal and a probability forecast. That's a smart approach, identifying not just stocks that are down, but those likely to recover. What about once they were in a trade? How did they manage the capital? Well, they wanted to spread the risk, so they allocated capital across a maximum of 20 long positions at once. Diversification. Exactly. And for each individual trade, they used a stop loss set 5% below the entry price. To limit potential losses. Yeah, and they also had a time limit of six trading bars. If the price didn't recover by then, they automatically closed the position. That makes sense. You don't want one bad trade to wipe out all your gains. What about making sure they were trading liquid stocks? You know, stocks you can easily buy and sell. Absolutely. Liquidity was a factor. They had filters to weed out penny stocks. So anything under a dollar was out. Right. And the amount of capital they put into a single trade was capped at 5% of that stock's average daily volume over the previous three months. So they couldn't take on a huge position in a thinly traded stock, which could be hard to get out of without moving the price too much. Precisely. It's all about managing risk and slippage. Okay, so they had all these rules in place for this long-only strategy. What did the backtest show? How did it perform? Well, the backtest gave them an annual return of around 27.4% with a sharp ratio of 1.17, but not bad at all. The maximum drawdown, which is the biggest peak to trough decline they saw, was about 46%. The strategy won about 62% of the time, with an average expected return of 0.5% per trade and a payoff ratio of 0.79. So it was winning more often than not, but not by huge margins. Right. 
And the creator themselves pointed out that the results weren't as amazing as they'd initially hoped for. Really? Yeah. And that slight underperformance compared to their expectations actually made them dig deeper and look for potential problems in their backtesting method. That's interesting. So they weren't just satisfied with a decent return. They wanted to understand why it wasn't even better. Exactly. They had high standards. Which brings us to the whole process of identifying and fixing biases. You mentioned obvious and subtle ones earlier. Let's start with the more common ones. Sure. There are a couple of classic traps people fall into when they're backtesting. Survivorship bias, for example, is when you only look at companies that are still in business. Right. So you're ignoring all the ones that failed along the way. Exactly. That can make your back-tested returns look way better than they would have been in reality. Because you're not accounting for the losing trades from those companies that went bust. Right. And then there's selection bias. This often happens when you run a ton of simulations with different parameters and then just focus on the one that performed the absolute best. Uh, so it's like cherry picking the best result, which might not be repeatable in real trading. Precisely. Okay, so those are important to watch out for. But the source material really emphasized this subtle selection bias they discovered. Can you unpack that for us? It seemed like a really insightful finding. Yeah, it was a key learning moment for the creator. Initially, they defined their trading universe as any stock that had ever been part of the Russell 3000 index, both currently and in the past. Hmm. So they were trying to be thorough and avoid survivorship bias by including companies that used to be relevant. Exactly. But the subtle bias came in when you considered a specific point in time within the back test. The system, looking back, could include stocks that weren't in the Russell 3000 at that specific time, but would be added later on. Uh, so even though they weren't using future price data, they were still kind of using future knowledge of which stocks would eventually be in the index. Right. And it worked the other way, too. The system could never consider stocks that never made it into the Russell 3000. So the composition of their potential trading universe was influenced by future index inclusions, even if it was unintentional. That's so sneaky. It highlights how easy it is to bake in look-ahead bias without even realizing it. Yeah, it's a great example of how seemingly logical assumptions can lead to biased results. So how do they fix it? They made their methodology more rigorous. From then on, for any point in the backtest, the trading universe only included stocks that were actually in the Russell 3000 at that specific historical moment. So they eliminated any future knowledge from the equation. And I remember there was a second data-related improvement they made specifically about how they trained the machine learning model. Yes, that's right. They wanted to make the training data more relevant. At first, they'd use the entire price history of any stock that had ever been in the Russell 3000 to train the model. Okay. But then they realized that a stock's behavior can change a lot when it joins or leaves a major index. I can see that. So they switched to training the model only on the price history of a stock during the times it was actually a member of the Russell 3000. So they narrowed the data down to make it more specific to the strategy's focus. Right. They wanted to avoid noise from periods when the stock wasn't subject to the same dynamics. Clever. They had this refined long-only model, but then they decided to add a short selling component. Why did they do that? They figured it might boost their returns and provide some hedging, like a way to potentially profit even if the market went down. They used the same features and training process for the short model, but adapted it to find stocks that were likely to go down. Interesting. So it was looking for mean reversion in both directions. Exactly. And how did they split the capital between the long and short sides? Was it a 50-50 split? Nope. It was intentionally uneven. The long portfolio could use up to 1.1 times their total capital, while the short side was capped at 0.2 times. Okay, so they were more cautious with the short selling. Right. Short selling can be riskier, so it's common to allocate less capital to it. They could have up to 20 long positions and 20 short positions at the same time. Got it. And what happened to their results when they added the short selling? Well, the combined long and short strategy did push their annual return up to 31.6%, and their sharp ratio increased slightly to 1.24. So positive on those fronts. But there was a catch. The maximum drawdown jumped up to about 50%. Oh, that's a pretty big increase. Yeah, it was a concerning sign, especially since most of their drawdowns before had been under 20%. It happened during the COVID market crash, which just goes to show that short selling can amplify losses during sudden downturns. Definitely a risk to consider. But their win rate only dropped slightly to 59.5%, and their payoff ratio actually improved to 0.87. So they were winning a bit less often, but 
making a bit more on the wins, which led to a slightly higher expected return per trade of 0.78%. Okay, interesting trade-offs there. And that brings us to the VIX-based regime filter. What's the logic behind using the VIX to manage risk? Well, the VIX, which people call the fear gauge, tends to spike when the market gets uncertain and volatile. And volatility often means big price swings, right? Exactly. And those big swings are often downwards. So by keeping an eye on the VIX, the strategy could try to spot those risky periods and adjust accordingly to reduce potential losses. Makes sense. So how do they actually use the VIX to define when the market was in a bearish or bullish regime? They first calculated a 15-day simple moving average of the VIX. Then they added 15% to that average to create a threshold. If the daily closing price of the VIX went above that threshold, they considered it a bear market signal. If it closed below, it was a bull market. Why those specific numbers? Well, the 15-day average was meant to be responsive to changes in volatility without overreacting to daily noise. Smoothing things out a bit. Right. And the 15% buffer was there to reduce the number of times the strategy switched between bull and bear signals. So preventing it from flip-flopping too much. Exactly. The creator mentioned that they got that 15% figure from analyzing historical VIX data. It represented the 90th percentile of the difference between the VIX and its 15-day average. Okay, so a pretty significant jump in volatility. Yeah, and it ensured that the system would stay in a bull market regime for about 90% of the time, which is more in line with historical market behavior. So once they'd figured out the market regime, how did that actually change how the strategy traded? How did it reduce risk during those bear market periods? Okay, so during a bull market, the allocations for long and short positions stayed at their normal levels. 1.1x for long and 0.2x for short. Business as usual. But when the VIX signaled a bear market, the long allocation got slashed to just 0.1 times their capital. Wow, a big reduction. And the short allocation stayed at 0.2 times. So basically, they became more short biased during those high risk times. That's interesting. So they weren't just reducing their overall exposure. They were actually shifting towards profiting from a potential market decline. Exactly. It was a way to potentially benefit from the downside while also hedging against losses in their remaining long positions. So a pretty active risk management approach. And what was the impact of all of this on their back test result? It was huge. Their annual return shot up to 41.9% and their sharp ratio climbed to 1.55. Those are some impressive numbers. Yeah. But the most dramatic change was the maximum drawdown. It plummeted from around 50% down to just 19%. That's a massive improvement. And their other stats like win rate and payoff ratio stayed pretty consistent. Plus, when they looked at the monthly and annual return since 2014 with the VIX filter, they didn't have a single losing year. Wow. So on paper, at least, this VIX filter seems like a game changer. Yeah, it seemed to make a huge difference, but of course we always have to remember that back tests are just simulations. Right. Past performance doesn't guarantee future results. Exactly. And the source material did mention trading costs as something to think about, how those could affect things in the real world. Right, because those can eat into your profits. Yeah, and in this case they were assuming pretty low trading costs, maybe a couple of basis points per trade. But this strategy trades individual stocks in the Russell 3000 not just super liquid ETFs. So the real world costs with commissions, slippage, and market impact could be a lot higher. Exactly, and the creator acknowledges that those costs could reduce the actual returns compared to the backtest. It's always a factor to consider. And I thought it was interesting that even with these great backtest results, the creator was still cautious. They kept coming back to that initial question, is this level of return really possible? Yeah, they seem to have a healthy dose of skepticism. Even the title of their analysis raised that question, and they said the results still looked almost too good to be true. It's smart to be cautious. Even the best back tests are based on historical data, and the market can always throw curveballs. Absolutely. They even went as far as rerunning the analysis without the crazy year that was 2020. Oh yeah, that was a wild one. And while their annual return dropped to 26% without that year, it still shows that the strategy has potential even outside of extreme market conditions. That's reassuring. And I really like their commitment to transparency. They said they'd keep monitoring the strategy for any new biases or areas for improvement and would share what they found. Yeah, that openness is important. It builds trust and shows they're committed to continuous learning. So wrapping it all up, we've explored this fascinating quantitative trading strategy that blends machine learning with mean reversion applied to a wide range of stocks. It's a complex system, but it seems to have some promising results. 
we saw how crucial it is to backtest thoroughly to catch both obvious and subtle biases. And we learned how a VIX-based regime filter can potentially manage risk and significantly reduce drawdowns during volatile periods. It's a reminder that success in trading, especially systematic trading, requires both sophisticated tools and a really meticulous approach. Absolutely. Like Walt Disney with his light bulbs, every detail matters. It's not just about crunching the numbers. It's about understanding the nuances of the market and constantly refining your approach. For sure. And even with impressive backtest results, there are always real-world factors to consider, like trading costs and the unpredictable nature of the markets. Right. A healthy skepticism is always warranted. But this deep dive has given us a lot to think about in terms of algorithmic trading and risk management. Hopefully, it sparked some ideas for you, the listener, about how these concepts might apply to your own investing or even other areas of your life. And who knows, maybe it'll even inspire you to start building your own trading strategy. But remember, be meticulous, be cautious, and always keep learning. That's the key takeaway here. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time. See you then.